morning. Welcome to Struggles of the Spirit. We're delighted you turned into the, onto the, this program this morning. And we're talking about retirement. Uh, what is it? Uh, how does it feel to be retired? How do you prepare for retirement? And uh, I've invited a, a, a friend and, uh, as our guest this morning, uh, Mr. William Hodgkins. Uh, he's an interesting man because in one sense he's retired, in another sense he's not retired at all. And so by what we're going to talk about uh, with him, uh, you're going to see there are some options and some professions to, to uh, be retired and yet not retired. That sounds like a bit of a conundrum, but uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, as we chat you'll, you'll understand uh, the last 15 minutes of our program from 12.15 until 12.30 is when we invite you to phone in and to participate in the program to ask uh, Mr. Hodgkins questions, or ask me questions, uh, or make your own statements. Uh, we invite you to, to join us here to make it a, a threesome uh, at 12.15. Uh, so please uh, have that in the back of your mind and you might write down some thoughts or questions you, you, or statements that you want to make uh, as we go along. You're ready for that opportunity at 12:15. So, Bill, uh, welcome. We're glad Thank to you, have Lee. you here. Glad to be here. Yeah, and uh, my first my first experience with something like this. Well, I I <clears throat> was first intimidated terribly by television. I was living in New York City, and I was on national television on CBS, <laughs> and I I was scared out of my wits. But uh, big audience, big audience, big audience. On, on sunrise semester. Yeah. It was put on, if you remember, uh, uh, early in the morning uh, educational program I had. Uh, <clears throat> but here in, in, in Adelphia Cable, uh, I feel very relaxed and uh, much more at, at peace than yeah, I did. At this CBS. is a relaxed setting. It is. It is. Um, why don't you tell us about what you did before your retirement took place uh, uh, and uh, some some well I'll, I'll leave it to you to choose sure. what you want to talk about and All then right. uh, well then we'll talk about <clears throat> how you prepared for retirement and and then how you got into this unique situation of being retired but yet not at all retired sure um, well I uh, my first career was uh, as a career naval officer in the US, in the United States Navy, and I started out <clears throat> right after college. Um, I went through college under the uh, partial auspices of the U.S. Navy. They helped pay my way through school on a Navy ROTC scholarship. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> so when I um, graduated from college, I had a commitment to the Navy to help pay back that scholarship. So I went right on active duty. Well, I got married first and went on active duty a few days later. And uh, I had a commitment to uh, serve uh, f at least four years in the Navy, but I decided that I wanted to try flying. Mm. So um, I you, was accepted for that. You couldn't sign up in ROTC as a future pilot then? Not, no, you have to make that choice in your senior year. Uh, sometime during your senior year, we had to make a choice of. Uh, an aviation career, uh, surface Navy career, or submarines. Mm -hmm. That was essentially mm -hmm. the three options we had. And, and, I, and I chose the, avi uh, the aviation route. In your last year in college? In my last year in college. Is this program still offered nowadays? It is, mm -hmm. yes. It's offered many fine schools throughout the country. Um, uh, any men or women now, of course, women are certainly uh, welcome and are making a big impact. Um, can apply for and if they're accepted, mm -hmm. uh, get a Navy scholarship to help them through school and go on active duty. So then you went on active duty or, or training, I suppose? So I went right on active duty um, right after graduation and then um, uh, they sent me down to the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida for the first part of my aviation training and then from there on to Corpus Christi for the advanced portion of the mm -hmm. aviation training. It's about a, almost a two-year process. And I finally got my wings in February of 1960. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then immediately started active flying. 
And uh, I uh, began to really like what I was doing. And uh, so at some point, I made a decision to be, make this my first career and just stay in and make the Navy my, my, my career. And so I did that, and um, uh, I started flying a uh, plane called the Super Constellation, which the Navy used back then for an airborne early warning mission. And uh, it was uh, a large airplane, had a big Twin radar. tail? Twin tail, triple tail. Tri triple tail, yeah. Four uh, reciprocating engines. And the Navy used it back then for uh, airborne early warning to protect the east coast and the west coast of the United States against Russian bombers. I, I flew uh, in regular commercial airlines on a Constellation years ago. Yes, right. Be before jets. Right. Yeah, and the Navy just picked up that. That was a commercial airliner, and the Navy just converted it to a Navy mission mm -hmm. and put the radar equipment on and so used it for early warning. So I, uh, I started out doing that for about the first two years of my active operational flying, and uh, they sent me up to uh, Argentia, Newfoundland <laughs> to start out. And we were flying an uh, uh, airborne early warning barrier patrol between Newfoundland and the Azores. And then in about 1961, the Russians started to, develop, uh, to deploy a faster, higher flying bomber, <coughs> which provided a little more of a threat to the to the coast, and so they moved the eastern barrier that I was participating in up to the Greenland Iceland UK gap. So we would deploy up to Iceland, and we'd fly the barrier patrols between Iceland and the UK, and between Iceland and Greenland uh, to the west. So that was some rough weather flying, and that's where I really developed my uh, all weather flying skills. <laughs> a lot more bumpy up there. Uh, it was bumpy. Um, it was, uh, of course, in the winter time. It's dark, 20, almost 24 hours a day in those latitudes. So it was a lot, awful lot of basically night flying. And mm -hmm. then uh, after that, I uh, I was sort of advised that I should be transitioning into another type of flying. So I did, and I transitioned into what's called carrier-based anti-submarine warfare and uh, transition to a different type of an airplane. You, you had been uh, uh, flying to and from land bases uh, yes, at this point. right, not okay. off carriers, right, just land-based. The Super Constellation was far too big to land on an aircraft I carrier. I would think so, yeah. So I transitioned to this plane, which was called the S-2 Tracker. It was a, a Grumman-built airplane, and it was strictly dedicated to anti-submarine warfare. Smaller plane, four people, pilot and co-pilot in the front, two uh, uh, anti-submarine warfare operators in the back, and it was carrier-based, two-engine, mm -hmm. uh, reciprocating engines, and it was carrier, uh, aircraft carrier-based. Um, and uh, so I started doing that, and that was basically the type of flying that I did when I was uh, in operational squadrons for the rest of my flying career in the Navy. And uh, that continued to go well. Um, kept getting, fortunately, kept getting promoted, and uh, ended up uh, sort of the end of my flying days as a commanding officer of a squadron, an mm -hmm. aviation squadron. That was in 1975, 76, and uh, so you you didn't. You weren't in active, uh, I mean, I say active duty, uh, maybe that's not the right term, but you weren't involved in the Vietnamese War or... or no, uh, I was on active duty, of course, all during Vietnam, but uh, not in uh, Vietnam or South China Sea because there really wasn't any threat from the Vietnamese, any submarine threat uh, from the Vietnamese, so there really wasn't any particular need for our uh, skills there. I guess the most um, thrilling experience that I had in my, early in my career, after I made the transi transition to the S-2, was in, 19, in the fall of 1962. I was on an aircraft carrier uh, in uh, the Guantanamo, Cuba area, just about the time the Cuban Missile Crisis broke out. Oh, that time, when? <laughs> so, that was uh, a hot spot then. Yeah, that was a real hot spot then. Uh, and I was on the USS Essex at the time, and 
the Essex had two 10-plane squadrons, so 20 planes of fixed-wing anti-submarine warfare aircraft, the type I was flying, and one helicopter squadron, 10-plane helicopter squadron, that was also dedicated to anti-submarine warfare. So when they established the blockade of Cuba, the mission of that particular aircraft carrier was to search out and find any Russian submarines that were in the waters there in the event that this became a shooting war, which mm -hmm. fortunately it never did. At the time, of course, we didn't know that. And uh, so we became part of that blockade of Cuba to prevent the Russians from putting the ballistic missiles that they were trying to put in there um, to keep them from doing that. And uh, early on in that, uh, in October, uh, we actually, on a night flight, it was, I'll never forget it, it was the first night flight that I'd ever experienced um, off an aircraft carrier, we actually located a Russian uh, diesel electric submarine. Oh my. And uh, far off pan shore. Pandemonium uh, from then on, but uh, it was probably 100 miles from Cuba. I'm not the, sure exactly. The, was it your, your plane that flew? Uh, the plane that I was in, yeah. Well, that is fun. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> you made history. I guess a little bit. Um, we detected this uh, small object on radar, and uh, we painted it for a few sweeps, and then it disappeared, which can mean that you've detected a snorkel, and then the submarine has detected your radar and decided to pull the plug and go down, which mm -hmm. is exactly what they did. So we went to the location that we had detected the, on the radar and uh, got some other indications that, that there was a submarine there and then called for help and we got a lot of help in a hurry. And uh, so between the, the fixed wing planes that I, the type I was flying and the helicopters, uh, we just kept track of this uh, Russian submarine for uh, about a week or 10 days. and. Uh, we were authorized to harass but not attack because it wasn't shooting war. So we harassed and uh, finally uh, harassed that submarine so much that it developed some serious mechanical and oxygen problems and had to exit out of the area. Hmm. It was no longer a factor. How so, did you know it was Russian and not uh, you know, some other nationality? Well, we knew where our submarines were um, and you can tell each submarine class has a sound signature, mm -hmm. like a fingerprint, mm -hmm. and so you can tell by the sound signature the class of the submarine, and we knew that this was a, a what's called in NATO terms a Foxtrot class Russian diesel submarine. Foxtrot? Foxtrot. <laughs> <laughs> they come up with all kinds of names, but it was okay. a Foxtrot class submarine. Oh, that's intriguing. Yeah, that was... Um, uh, it was a lot of uh, a lot of intense flying, and uh, turned out to be a very important part of uh, our relationship between the United States and and Russia at the time. Because if that situation had gotten much worse, you remember that was a time when Kennedy and Khrushchev were sort of eyeball to eyeball, right. and then Khrushchev finally bl blinked. But we were very close to a. <clears throat> to a nuclear war at that point. Yeah, I was living in New York City at the time, and uh, I was teaching school. And uh, I, I remember we all were aware that New York City might be vaporized, and uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of us were talking about whether we would um, want to stay there and run that risk or, or, or not. And mm -hmm. uh, and many of us said, "Well, I'd just as soon die with my friends, I guess, and we'll just we'll just stay and do our normal thing." And uh, yeah. we did. But I, I remember the yeah. the anxiety. Uh, People were building dugouts and uh, storing stuff in their basements, and uh, yeah. it was a scary time. Well, New York City had bomb shelters bomb everywhere, shelters, right. but <clears throat> they really could be very practical for atomic no weapons. And mm -hmm. So. When, now, when you signed up uh, <coughs> to be in the Navy uh, and you decided to make that your career, was there a, a time that you were told what is the average career length before retirement? Uh, yeah, uh, it was well known, uh, it was published uh, that if you 
stayed in the Navy uh, for 20 years, okay. you could retire with a pension from the U.S. Navy. Uh, and the longer you stayed, the more the pension. Could that be true? Uh, I mean, after 20 years have gone by, if you stay 25, 30 years, yep. each extra year increases, it increases the, the pension. pension. Right. And I was fortunate enough to be able to stay for 30 years. And ah. The, the general rule is it's, it's a, an up or out system. If you keep getting promoted, you can keep staying in. Hmm. Once you're passed over for the next higher rank, then you have a year or two, and then you have to get out, retire. That's a, that's a, that's a hint, you might say, a it's strong a hint. hint. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> Start thinking about a second career. <laughs> So I was fortunate enough to be able to stay uh, on active duty for 30 years, and uh, then I retired after 30 years in uh, August of 1988. Oh, 1988. 88. Well, let me ask you along that line. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm no expert on, on the military, but I, I've known a number of military people who have retired, and some of them have found it not necessarily picking up another career like you have. Uh, some of them found it very difficult because they, they were so used to the military providing everything they needed and uh, telling them what to do and what not to do that uh, uh, they found civilian life uh, very hard. They, 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 uh, they were on their own and uh, their life wasn't controlled and, and uh, managed and uh, I mean, the military is ultimate managed care, you know. <laughs> right. And uh, a lot of support. A lot of support, and suddenly they didn't have that. Was that a problem for you when, when you first left the, the Navy? Well, yeah, I speak for myself, it certainly was. I think it's a problem for anybody who spent 20 or 30 years in that kind of an environment to make that transition, depending on what you transition to. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of career people transition into another large organization or into government work, either state or federal. Mm -hmm. and they're still in a big system that has a lot of support. So I think it do depends on, a lot of the, on the individual. So they would do that on purpose, knowing that this is a common problem. Uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, and depending on what's available at the time and what their special skills are. Mm -hmm. uh, in my particular case, I, I wanted to make a, a change, and I had always had a bit of a, I guess, a entrepreneurial or business um, uh, desire to try to do something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that and, and made the transition from the Navy to being basically a sole proprietor and owning my own business, which is what I am now, a sole proprietor. And it's a, it was a very difficult transition for the first couple of years because, as you said, we had all these support systems in the Navy, had a secretary, had an office. Uh, that the government paid for, mm -hmm. that I didn't have to pay for, um, and you always knew where the next check was coming from. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was plenty of support in the Navy as there is in the other services for the family, I had a wife and four children, and there was always plenty of support there. But when you make that transition to being a self-employed individual, um, then everything's on your own. You have to do everything for yourself. Very and different. If you have a secretary, you pay for that secretary. Uh, Did the military prepare you for that change? Or? I don't know what they would do to prepare you, but I no. still want to ask the question. No. no. I think the best preparation was the fact that they provided we, me with a, with a pension. Mm -hmm. And so if I didn't make a dollar uh, as a sole proprietor, I had that Navy pension to fall back on to pay the rent and buy food and keep the family you know, uh, maintain a basic standard of living, How you, uh, which is uh, a very important thing, I think, for military retirees. Absolutely. Well, would a military retiree also get Social Security? Yes. That's okay. So yeah, we contribute to the Social Security system right. so throughout would, our career. So you would ha have both? Yeah, once you turn 62 or 65, uh, depending on when you want to draw it, you, you're eligible for Social Security retirement benefits as well. So. Uh, you hadn't intended to uh, uh, just uh, take it easy once you, you left the, the, uh, uh, the, the Navy. I think that's one of the things about any military career, including the Navy, is that if you start uh, an active career at age 22, 
and you spend 20 years in, you're only 42. In my case, I was 52. Uh, that's kind of early to just throw in the towel and not do anything. Sure is. Um, besides just the stimulus of working and being productive uh, financially, it's very difficult to make that bridge between age 42 or 52 and age 62 or 65 to draw Social Security benefits. So just from a financial standpoint, you almost need to do something to mm -hmm. uh, have continuing income, build perhaps another retirement if you can on top of the, the military one. Um, and I think that's what most people do. Most people don't want to just kick, kind of kick back and not do anything, unless they're independently wealthy, uh, you know, mm. aside from. Right. <clears throat> yeah, well, you would have to, uh, you'd be too young to, to get uh, uh, Medicare. Right. <laughs> so you would have to uh, come up with the cash for a, a policy, and a, a medical policy, insurance policy. And so many of them, and you know better than I, are, are, are preferential if there's a group you can be a member of right and uh, an individual subscriber finds it hard to to get a, a, a policy that favorable well we do we, we, there is another benefit to military retirement and that is uh, we have this the champus medical system oh yes uh, yeah. that continues after retirement up until you're Medicare eligible at age 65. But you have to be near a base, though. No, no, yeah. you can use Champus in the civilian community. Oh, yeah, that's very decent. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's a very good plan. So do you, you have that's Champus? That's what I have. Right. Oh, right. I, I, I've known yeah. of Champus, but I didn't know any yeah. details it's about. It's basic, it. very good medical, basic policy, and then uh, uh, you can, f you can um, build on that with a, what they call a Champus supplement, which is like a Medicare supplement, but. Well, why is it I run across people who have been in the military and uh, they uh, they say, like here in Vermont, well, I, I have to, if I want to see a, a doctor, I need to go over to the White River uh, to the VA hospital and see one there. Uh, why why can't they well, uh, it, do it here? I'm not sure. In particular circumstance, it could be that they haven't actually retired, so uh -huh. they're not eligible for retirement benefits, which would be Champus. Uh, it could be that they prefer to use the Veterans Administration because it's basically free coverage. There's no deductibles, no co-payments or anything like that if you're, v if you're VA eligible. So if somebody has VA benefits, medical benefits, they're basically getting full care at government expense. Mm -hmm. But you have to have some sort of a uh, active service related um, pre-existing condition or disability to qualify for VA benefits. So most people don't, most retirees don't qualify. Oh, so. For VA benefits. I see, yeah, so. They qualify for Champus if they're retired, but they don't qualify for Veterans Administration benefits unless they have a service-connected disability. Well, that's helpful to know. Hmm. So, uh, as we were talking here before the program started, so uh, do people in insist on saying, well, you're retired now, Bill, uh, you're just doing this as a hobby uh, uh, in insurance? You know, I don't hear that. Uh, people uh, see my business card and they see U.S. Navy retired, um, so this, the conversation often, often comes around to what did you do in the Navy, but not why are you still working? Okay. Um, that seems to be generally accepted that that people are going to work, I guess, uh, even after they've had a first career, perhaps in the service or some someplace else. Yeah, well, so I don't get that that type of a that. question. Okay. That's what I get. Uh, Do you? Uh, I say I'm part time. I'm, I, I wanted to slow up, but I, I didn't want to retire. I said, Well, you're over 65, Lee, aren't you? See, I think maybe that's the, the issue. That, uh, yeah, I got a couple more years to go. On that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, well, yeah, I'm over 65, but I'm, I'm not going to retire. I'm, I want to slow up. Yeah, right. that's true. Right. Uh, but I don't want to retire, and uh, I wanna, right. I'm just self-employed part time. That's all. And uh, 
they, uh, people say, well, what church are you, are you assigned to? I said, well, I don't have a church. I'm, I, I'm on my own, and that confuses them even more. Yeah, right. So, uh, well, I think you probably agree that that uh, if you continue being active, even in your what some people might consider to be retirement years, in my opinion, it's 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 healthy because mm -hmm. it keeps your mind active, uh, it keeps you moving around and getting outdoors every day, and. Uh, so I think it's a healthy type of thing, whether the, you need the money or not. Um, it's probably a good thing to do. My father is uh, 94 years old, almost 95, and he worked up until about a year ago. And he'd had a couple of careers, but he just kept on working. And that's probably one of the reasons that he's still in pretty good health and active and living by himself or living in his own home at age 94. So yeah. uh, I, I, you know, I happen to agree with that, or believe in that philosophy. Yeah, well, I, I do too. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I was shocked some years ago, uh, some older people, who, uh, they were sent, trying to remember someone's name, <coughs> and they couldn't remember the name, and they said, oh, see, that's a Senior moment, that's what I call them, a senior <laughs> moment. So I, I said, no, I don't like that. You know, uh, yeah. I, I think you're putting down older people. Uh, there is, it is true, sometimes uh, as you get older, your short-term memory isn't as good as it used to be. But there are many times where it's not your age that's given you problems with memory, it's that you're out of practice. Uh, when you were younger, when you had a career, uh, you had to know names of people. I mean, if you were a, a real estate a, uh, agent, or if you were a uh, life insurance agent, uh, uh, you 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 couldn't forget the names of your clients. No, it's, it would not. It's not good business. So no, that's right. You you would work hard at remembering those names, but then when you're really 100 percent retired, uh, you're not really you're not, not focused on that. You're not focused on it anymore, so you let it slip. Right. And uh, right. and then it's not a senior moment. That's just you're getting lazy. <laughs> yeah, mentally lazy. Mentally lazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, so I I think sometimes uh, uh, people who are over 65 uh, uh, begin to think uh, poorly of themselves when they really shouldn't. Yeah. Right. Uh, so how long are you going to, well, why don't you tell the, 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 our viewers, and, and this is your camera here, Bill, uh, why don't you tell them what, what you do? Uh, well, uh, I made the transition from uh, the Navy, as we talked about, to uh, being a sole proprietor, independent contractor as a life insurance uh, agent um, and um, broker. And uh, so we, I provide financial services of all kinds. Uh, to all my clients, uh, and it, it includes um, sort of the basic underpinnings of health insurance, disability insurance, and life insurance to make sure people are adequately protected against um, illness, um, disability, or premature death. And then uh, once we have that floor established of insurance uh, coverage, then we get into the wealth accumulation mode, uh, building wealth or for retirement purposes to can send kids through school or any other wealth accumulation purpose that the client might have. And uh, so we use a number of investment vehicles to do that, such as annuities and mutual funds and, 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 and uh, cash value life insurance. And, uh, and then uh, for more senior citizens, we've gotten into, recently gotten into this whole area of long-term care insurance, which is uh, a way to protect the wealth that has been accumulated from uh, having to spend it all the last few years of life in a nursing home, something like that, or in home health care. So now uh, we're into this uh, whole area of protecting an estate, protecting somebody's wealth once it's been accumulated with uh, long-term care insurance. And we also do some estate planning.
planning work in terms of protecting uh, the uh, assets that have been built up over the years from the uh, real estate tax bite once they die, being able to pass that, uh, that estate on to the next generation and the generation after that without having the government eat up more than, than they have to. So it's a, it's a full service financial uh, career um, with insurance, annuities, uh, mutual funds, and uh, this whole area of long term care insurance now. And uh, it's a career that I would certainly recommend that a lot of people consider if they're, if they're looking for an, another profession because uh, you become uh, a sole proprietor, you create, you can have your own schedule, uh, you're not working for someone else, uh, you can keep this career going um, as long as you want, um, you don't, you're not forced to quit or retire at some particular point, you can just keep on working as long as you feel you're productive and are helping your clients and uh, it's, it's really a it's very uh, intriguing business to be in. You don't have to stop at age 65. Don't have to stop at age 65. <coughs> right. There's a lot of career um, agents and financial professionals that work well into their 70s and perhaps even later than that. Um, as long as they're able to do the job, provide the service to their clients, um, then why not? So that's, that's what I'm doing now. Perhaps your career uh, as a pilot and having to worry about uh, where am I in the sky, <laughs> quadrants and compass directions and radio signals and a lot of statistics, I would imagine, to be a pilot, aren't there? Uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's math skills involved and, yeah. So that, that gives you uh, uh, an advantage when it comes to dealing with figures and life insurance and yeah. Investments, uh, perhaps a little bit. Yeah, you, you got to be comfortable with with the numbers, and you've got to be um, always staying abreast of new developments in in the insurance uh, and the financial services industry to uh, to keep abreast of things. So it's a constant learning process. Um, I wouldn't say there's any particular. Um, educational skill or math skill that's really necessary. Most folks that get through school uh, have the basic skills, educational skills that are needed. I think it's just a willingness to keep on learning and being able to keep up with what's going on in the industry because it's very, f it's changing rapidly. Consumers are, are uh, becoming more and more educated. Uh, they want to be sure that what they're purchasing is competitive and of value and uh, so you've got, to, you've got to stay on top of it to provide the best service you can. Bill has a, has a special uh, a gift, I think. He, uh, uh, he's very personable. He'll help you to understand uh, complex insurance issues. Uh, he'll come to your own home and uh, uh, sort of help you work your way through decisions that might be necessary. Uh, uh, you don't feel so much on your own trying to uh, resolve some of these important uh, problems and needs. Uh, Thanks, Lee. Appreciate oh, I, that. I really yeah. feel that very strongly. Uh, you, you are an advocate for your clients, you know. Mm -hmm. So That's interesting you would say that because we've been going through some seminar series uh, and the gentleman who was putting on the series was was um, reinforcing the fact that that's what we are as advocates for our clients. He used the same word. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. But uh, I've had other uh, agents and uh, before I met you and uh, th their level of function was, was not like yours. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if I could get a plug-in for um, for my particular company, Northwestern Mutual Life, uh, we are we have an office out in uh, Essex Junction. It's a district agency, and we are always looking for good people who might want to consider this as a career. Huh? And uh, we would certainly welcome uh, anybody that was wanted to talk about it 
with no commitments, just a general discussion about what it is we do and what, how they might fit in if they're interested. And uh, if someone wanted to do that, they could call me uh, at 879-3330 uh, and we could have an initial meeting and see if this is something that you wanted to pursue. And then I would introduce you to the district agent and uh, go from there. It's, it's a fascinating career and uh, I could certainly recommend it to anybody that thought they, they might. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, you've got to work hard. Um, but uh, it's, it can be a very good, rewarding career. Second career. <laughs> Second career. <laughs> Second career. <laughs> but it can be a first career. <clears throat> now, are you going to have a third career? I'm not planning on it. You're not planning on it. I think it might be part-time golf and fishing. Ah, okay. <laughs> I know you like golf, and yeah. uh, I didn't part know time. that you, 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 you like fishing, too. Yeah. <clears throat> but you can do that when you become sort of semi-retired in this business. Um, you can cut back. You don't have to work uh, eight hours or ten hours a day and set your own schedule and play a couple rounds of golf per week or go fishing or whatever. Sounds, <laughs> sounds very attractive. Uh, so in general, uh, Bill, uh, uh, that not just in terms of what you're doing or what you did in the, in the Navy, uh, what you have some words of wisdom you want to you want to offer to the, the public about getting ready for retirement and, uh, and uh, attitudes well, that might be important, uh, plans that they should undertake? Well, I think in, in terms of attitude, um, it's one of being focusing a little bit on the fact mm -hmm. that uh, that you do want to continue working um, and have a have a second career. Um, I think the the difficult thing for many people is there are so many opportunities available, particularly in today's environment where anybody that really wants to work can work uh, in the United States. Uh, so you got so many so you got so many choices and and uh, and so many opportunities. It sort of becomes a matter of focusing on what is it that I would like to do in my second career that would make me happy and productive. Uh, it's sort of an opportunity to, to reflect back and say, you know, have I enjoyed what I've done so far? Uh, if so, is this something I would like to continue? Or would I like to make a completely different change and go off in a different direction? Mm -hmm and uh, maybe explore something that I've always thought I wanted to do but haven't been able to do so far because I've been locked into this particular profession. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good opportunity to uh, really think about um, what it is you might want to do for maybe the second half of your life or the last 20 years of your working life or whatever. Um, and then uh, if you're in a position to take advantage of that and, and go pursue it. Um, one of the things that I'm still thinking about a little bit is uh, I've always wanted to be a bit, bit of a musician. I never, I never was able to do that, um, but I might want to do that sometime. Someone else might, you know, want to be an educator after re retirement. But there's so many opportunities. You can just about do whatever you want to if you're willing to work for it. So I think that's, you know, focus on focus on what it is you want to do and then um, just go do it. Um, in terms of preparation, is that what you asked, Lee? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Again, it depends on what, how, how busy you are in the latter days of your first career. It's kind of hard in the Navy to do a lot of preparation for a second career because you're tied very closely to what it is you're doing as an active duty person. Uh, you don't have a lot of time to go out and go visit different industries and take time away. Um, but uh, to the extent that somebody can do that and explore some other alternatives, say a year or so before they actually retire, uh, that's always helpful. Other than that, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Um, your experience with, with the pension after 20 years, 
this is not generally also true if you're in the in police force or or, or pay, regular paid full-time firemen uh, those those kinds of uh, civic uh, yeah work um, I think so yeah, I'm not really familiar with how their retirement systems work but I think most uh, public service people like fire the fire uh, uh, fire men and police officers uh, do have an opportunity to retire fairly early and get a pension either right away or deferred until some point and then have another career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, police can obviously move into detective work or a lot of, a lot of different things. But yeah. yeah, when I was uh, living in New York City, uh, <coughs> I, I knew that there were a lot of uh, of uh, guards at the Metropolitan Museum of Art who who were f former, former police. policemen. Yeah, and the museum liked that because uh, they were they were licensed to carry a revolver if need be. They had other guards who who were not licensed to carry a revolver. And yeah. So so they had a mix of guards who who had firearms on their person and others who who didn't mm -hmm. and. Uh, so they could select to who w would be in what particular section of the museum where firearms might be more important than others. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure there are many places like that where mm -hmm. people might might work. And that's after being in a police force. It's a rather nice, generally quiet kind of work to do <laughs> in a right. museum. Yeah. <laughs> Not nearly as dangerous as being out on the streets. Yes, and uh, in your business, uh, you're not trying to catch a cable on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the night. Uh, right. Uh, that's right. that's a lot less dangerous. Yeah, it's a lot less risk, yes. personal risk. Yeah. Well, I think it's just about time now for people to uh, to phone in. So we're asking you now to uh, to, to call us. The uh, number to call is on your screen, on your TV screen in your home. Please give us a ring. Uh, as soon as we have a uh, input from you, we'll uh, we'll stop talking, Bill and I, and we'll listen to your thoughts. And uh, we really would like to have you call because it it makes it more interesting for us. Uh, we like to get feedback to know how we're being understood and uh, whether our our uh, contributions are are being really heard. Uh, so please please give us a ring and we'll we'll stop chatting as soon as as soon as you, you call this a meeting here this morning with uh, Bill Hodgkins who, who uh, is in his second career and he was a Navy pilot in his first career and, and now he's in uh, life insurance and other f forms of related insurance and please please call. If I could, before if, uh, we take any calls, Lee, uh, if I could get a plug in for the services, uh, anyone that might be interested in learning a little bit more about uh, this uh, ROTC scholarship uh, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. option or the service academies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've got three fine service academies um, or uh, just uh, an enlistment in the Navy. Mm -hmm. You can find out all that information at the local recruiting office. They have, a, uh, they have the information about all the colleges across the country that participate in the ROTC programs, mm -hmm. both the Air Force, the Navy, and the, and the uh, U.S. Army. And the Marine Corps, of course, is part of the Navy, so mm -hmm. somebody that um, initially signs on with a Navy program can branch off into the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's interested in something like that can uh, certainly find out information at their local recruiter. Good idea. Uh, that's really planning ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to make the, the service a second career. No. Uh, that doesn't work. No. They want young, healthy, active, uh, intelligent folks and uh, people that are dedicated to. And will they still uh, underwrite your education? Yes. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works now, but uh, I think all the services have some sort of a program 
where if you if someone enlists for X number of years, they develop credits during that enlistment that can be transferred into dollars for college after their enlistment is up. And for people going into the officer programs, um, it's the scholarship through college that's helping to pay the way, and then that leads to a commission upon graduation, and that's the payback. Mm -hmm. Four years or five years of active duty after, after getting the degree. That's quite a special deal because, uh, as you well know, uh, if you don't have something planned like that, you have to pay, or your parents have to pay cash, and to go to college these days is up in the twenty thousand dollar and right. higher range and right. per year, you know, and right, <laughs> right. I mean, it's pretty prohibitive. That's right. That's one of the financial planning things that we do with people is try to figure out and uh, ways to uh, meet uh, future college costs for for your children. And when you look at today's costs in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty five thousand dollars for private schools and ten to ten thousand or above for public supported schools, and then you project that out for ten or fifteen years with a some sort of an inflation rate to it, you know, you're looking at a lot of money to send someone through school. Sure is. So you've got to either start early in a savings program or um, expect to have some assistance through maybe the services to, to help with school or um, incur a lot of debt. And uh, that's the way a lot of people are handling it now. As they go through school, they end up with a, a big debt when they graduate that they end up paying for for a long time. A long time, a larger debt than than even a, a home mortgage. Right. Often, I mean, right. It's just uh, yeah, hundred thousand yeah. dollars in debt to a college is not unheard of nowadays. No, a, a lot of, a lot of money. <laughs> sure is. So we're encouraging you to phone in, and uh, uh, you can be any age here. And uh, Bill makes it as we talk. It makes it attractive for any anyone to call and not just people who are retirement years uh, um, plan ahead right if they want to hear uh, some more about the military we'll be glad to talk about that or if you have grandchildren uh, and you're thinking about them uh, uh, give us a ring and we can get some practical advice here right now uh, we're glad to glad to receive your call um, I've discovered over the well now about two years of, of this program, a lot of people don't necessarily turn on the program at the very beginning. They, they pick it up like at noon or or twelve fifteen. I see. Sometimes they're they're channel hopping and they don't even know what it is. And yeah. And uh, I I have to identify it probably even more than I've been doing uh, what it is. So they mm -hmm. they. Uh, do you get calls after the program to your house, for example? Well, not, usually. not usually. I had one last week, yeah. but that was on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what, just a question here, Bill. When, when you when you left the the, the Navy, uh, were you required to stay in the reserves for a number of years? No. Once you retire, uh, you've completed your your service obligation, so there's no. There's no reserve. No re requirement to stay in the reserves. Mm -hmm. um, somebody, I think the I'm, I'm not quite sure how this works now, but I think if somebody just goes on active duty for a sh relatively short period of time, then they have the opportunity to s go into the reserves and continue um, monthly reserve meetings to continue to build credits toward a, re a, a military pension. Mm -hmm. Um, but that takes a long time because you're only on active duty, say, once per month for a weekend. Yeah. And then you, you build, gradually build the credits toward retirement that way. Um, and I think that that retirement doesn't kick in until age 60, I believe. Mm -hmm. That's the way it works. And, of course, the National Guard is another uh, option that, that folks have. They can, they can go into the Guard as well and build retirement. Uh, credits that way through the guard, through the, through the air guard or the army guard or 
uh, things like that. Yeah, I know a number of people who are active in the Guard. Yeah. Yeah, around here there's a lot, the Guard bases here. Yeah. Of course, we see the F-16s. Yes, we, we, and we hear them, too. <laughs> flying, <laughs> flying around all the time, yeah. yeah. Quite an airplane. <clears throat> Do you get a chance to fly anymore? No, I don't. Uh, I've thought about uh, some, uh, but of course, uh, one of the issues with continuing to fly uh, in a different, when you're involved in a different career, is trying to stay current mm -hmm. and be safe. Yeah. And uh, it takes time, and and you you got to work at it, uh, and it's expensive. Um, so I haven't done that. I've, I may do it at some point, but I haven't continued to fly. My yeah. last flying days were about 1975, 1976, as we talked about earlier. And uh, I was on a big aircraft carrier then, uh, the USS Independence. And uh, that was really sort of the last active flying that I did. We were in the process then of transitioning from the plane that I was talking to you about, the S-2, which was a two-engine recep to uh, the S-3 Tracker, which was a uh, high-bypass turbo fan, fan jet aircraft. Mm -hmm. Same mission, but more modern equipment, bigger plane, a lot faster, um, more capable. But, um, and that's still on active duty now. That's flying off our large deck carriers like the USS Nimitz, Nimitz-class carriers, and all the ones we have now. Still doing the same function, mm. anti-submarine warfare. Well, I hadn't realized that was a whole entity in itself. Yeah, but now the the, the large uh, carriers that uh, we hear about, uh, large carriers off of, in the Persian Gulf um, and other parts of the world, they're really multi-mission. Um, they have fighter aircraft on board. Uh, they have attack aircraft, air-to-ground attack planes. They have early warning aircraft, electronic warfare aircraft, helicopters, the anti-submarine warfare aircraft. It's a multi-mission mm. capability. An aircraft carrier, which uh, today is now is, I guess, well over 100,000 tons and wow. it would be 1,200 feet from, from bow to stern. You know, it's a floating city. Um, with perhaps up to a hundred airplanes on it of all these different types that I just talked about. And uh, I, I believe the complement of a, aircraft, a modern aircraft carrier uh, with an air wing on board would be about 6,000 people. My goodness. And it can move uh, around at uh, 30 knots or more. So it's quite a potent weapon system. It sure is. Sure is, but they still have to worry about uh, attack on, to the ship itself, I suppose. Oh yeah, but there's um, I mean, part of the resources that they have available to protect the the carrier. Um, its speed and its maneuverability are important in protection. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that they're invulnerable, but they. Uh, it would be diff pretty difficult to, to bring one down. A uh, nuclear weapon overhead would probably do the job, though. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Sure. If somebody could get it there. Well, we, we still invite you to, uh, to call uh, uh, our viewers who have, have uh, tuned in to this channel. Uh, we're talking about retirement and uh, our guest today is uh, uh, Mr. Bill Hoskins, and he has the unique experience of of having served in the uh, military and have is retired from the military and uh, from the Navy, and now now he's in, uh, in selling insurance uh, of various types, and uh, uh, it's a whole new career for him. So. Call in if you have some questions about how can you do that? How can you have another career? Uh, and why have another career? Why not just uh, 
play golf and uh, <laughs> mow the lawn. Why, 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 uh, why, why have a career, a second career? And maybe, maybe Bill, uh, this toward the end here of the few minutes we have left, wh why do you uh, have a second career? I mean, obviously you'll make some more money. Uh, obviously you'll uh, be more on your toes uh, intellectually, emotionally. Uh, but uh, why, uh, why did you choose to do that? Well, I think it's a need to uh, continue to feel productive in some mm -hmm. way. Um, I think that's basically it. And the money is uh, part of it. Um, but um, I think it's basically a need to continue to feel productive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just uh, <clears throat> wouldn't feel comfortable, I guess, and just kind of kicking back and just doing what I, playing, playing golf and fishing all the time or doing something else. I think I'd get bored with that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that in my case, and I think it's true in most, most people, uh, that you need to have uh, a feeling that you're doing something useful and something productive, uh, both for yourself and for the people that you work with or for whom you work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I think that's basically what it is. I, I, I would buy that. That's, that's true for me, too, as a re uh, quote unquote retired person. Uh, to have something meaningful that you're doing, right. something fruitful that right. you're doing. Sometimes uh, widows uh, who've spent their lives looking after their spouses and, and maybe having a profession, uh, they often say when uh, they're alone, uh, they'll say, no one needs me anymore. And it's really said with a lot of pain, a lot of, uh, right. a lot of uh, agony, uh, that, that need to be needed is very deep in all of us mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's a good reason f for us when we're retired to not be f fully retired slow up maybe mm -hmm. yes I like that term for slow myself up. slow up some I mean I know I don't have the stamina that I used to but I, I do so I do know I need to slow up but I don't need to stop right. <laughs> that's big difference between slowing up and stopping right for us in the insurance business too, it, it's uh, it's rewarding to see um, the results of your work on, on on occasion. When you see somebody who you're helping to invest for retirement, and their investment account keeps growing every year, uh, and if uh, somebody's unfortunate enough to die with your life insurance in hand, and so the the surviving members of the family have got a big check there. Mm -hmm. Uh, or if somebody becomes disabled and now you're providing continuing income because they're dis because you had disability insurance, uh, all these things, um, you can s begin to see some of the effects of your work. So it's productivity. It's nice to hear you say it like that, that uh, because uh, someone who who didn't know might think, well, you know, it's a business, so you don't care as long as you make money. That's all that matters, but. You're, you're, you're not that kind of a guy, and that's why I personally do business with you. You know, you, you really value, you know, what the services that you provide, what they do for the, for the client, and uh, I think that's admirable. Bill, I, I think our time is about up. And, yes, uh, I think so, Lee. So I, I want to thank you for, yeah, for taking the risk of being here on television and uh, for the first yeah, time the on first television. Time. Right. I hope you f have found it a good experience. I have been very, very uh, useful and I've enjoyed talking with you and sharing some ideas about retirement. Well, thanks. Hope, I hope uh, some of the audience uh, uh, will uh, get some information out of this and might be useful for them. You may find some of your viewer, some of the viewers will uh, be also be clients and they may say to you sooner or later, hey, I saw you on television. That might be true. Yeah. I, 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 I'm glad I'm working with you. <laughs> Well, thanks, Lee. Thank you. Say hi to Sue, and uh, I sure will. I hope sure to see will. you soon in the, in the near future. Well, sooner or later, we we stick together. Right. Yeah. <laughs>